Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. And we continue our series of uh, Newsmaker Archive shows with Kevin Doran going back now to October 8th, 1992, when Kevin interviewed former Reagan advisor and speechwriter Lynn Knopfsinger. We, uh, we have a mix of, uh, of guests on this program. We have local folks and we have people in the county level, state level, uh, congressmen, senators, uh, national figures. Every once in a while, we get a, someone on the show who, is, uh, who has been up in the, in the big leagues, not only been in the big leagues, but had a very important part to play in the running of the ship of state. We have such a, a man on our program today, Lim Knopfsinger. Uh, those of you who follow politics in America will know that name immediately. Lynn Knopfsinger was with President Reagan when he was the governor of California. He was a very important figure in his uh, first election campaign and a very important figure in his first administration. This is one of those people who helped change the course of the the ship of state. Good morning, Mr. Knopfsinger. Uh, good morning, Kevin. How are you? Good. I don't know if you heard that introduction or not. Yeah, uh, I did, and I loved every word of it. Well, that's... <laughs> You know, uh, peop- I was saying on the program yesterday when I, when I was telling them you were coming on, uh, for people who don't follow politics as well as some of us, and that's okay because you, there are other things to do like baseball and football. Uh, m- much more important. <laughs> but uh, the, the example I used, I said, this is the fellow, when President Reagan was shot in 1981, this is the fellow who stepped forward and uh, became the press spokesman, the press secretary, been seriously wounded, and, and you just stepped into that job. And I think a lot of people will recall that, because that's something all of us will remember. That was such an important moment. Um, you've written a book now, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody persuaded me I ought to. It's not a, it's not a serious book. It doesn't tell uh, uh, how I saved the nation or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, it's largely anecdotal. It's a, it's a book that I enjoyed writing. Hey, and I want it known I wrote it. Okay. <laughs> you, you don't have a Brent Bozell somewhere in the no, background. No, nowhere. Um, you, uh, you were with President Reagan when he was governor in California, right? That's right. Is that when you first met up with him? Yeah, I met up with him, uh, oh, in the middle of 1965 when I was a reporter. He, uh, President Reagan's brother was a longtime friend of mine, and, and when it looked like he was going to run for... Uh, governor, uh, I called his brother and asked him if he'd set up a meeting between uh, uh, the uh, the then movie actor and me, mm-hmm. uh, which he did, and at which meeting he denied that he was going to run for governor. So mm-hmm. I went back and wrote a story saying he was going to run for governor. Mm-hmm. You, you knew what was happening then. Uh, what was your first impression of Ronald Reagan? A very nice man. You know, first impression is uh, uh, you, you can get to the surface things, but it's hard to tell whether a man is uh, uh, honest or brilliant or anything like that. It takes a little knowing of him or knowing about him, but uh, I found him to be a very nice man, and later on I found him to be uh, pretty smart and a very, a very honest, decent individual. Mm-hmm. Uh- Ed Meese has written a book. I'm sure you've read it recently. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the former attorney general said that one of the great myths of American history, modern history, is that Ronald Reagan was not a hands-on president, that he, was, that he slept through the first uh, four years, didn't pay much attention in the second four. What's the real truth of that situation? Well, I probably disagree just a little bit with Ed. And, and I must say this, Ed spent a lot more time around him than I did because Ed likes government and I don't. But... Uh, Reagan is, was a great delegator, uh, and that's fine. I think he ought to be. But at the same time, Ed is right uh, in the in the Reagan state. On top of things, he just didn't try to micromanage, mm-hmm. and uh, and I wouldn't want Ed's book to to give the impression that that Reagan worried about all the details of government. He didn't, and deliberately he didn't think that was his job. Mm-hmm. He sort of set the course and, and then moved it and gave it to delegates, right? Well, that's right, and, you know, made the tough decisions and, and, and was there when, when he had to be. But, uh, but the idea of, uh, of, well, I always contrast him to Jimmy Carter. When Jimmy Carter first came into office, he literally kept the schedule on his desk of who played tennis on the White House tennis court. Right. Well, uh, you know, that's not the job of the president, and Reagan understood that instinctively. Now, in the first administration, what exactly was your position? I was the assistant to the president for political affairs. Mm -hmm. That's a very important job. You must see the president a great deal in a job like that. Well, you see him as often as you want to. One of the things uh, that that I've always thought in this business is you don't go bother somebody who who has other things on his mind. And while politics is important uh, uh, or 
to to getting the job done and so forth. It's not a policy job. Uh, I wasn't in there trying to 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 steer him uh, toward how you handle Nicaragua or or anything like that. Our job was was to make sure that uh, that he got the support when he needed it. When did you leave the administration? Well, I only stayed a year. I hadn't intended to go at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they finally uh, uh, convinced me that this was a job worth doing, I, I said, I'll give you a year, and I did. Mm -hmm. I then went back the next year for a couple of weeks to to help Ronald Reagan uh, make a success of one of the big mistakes of his administration, which was to pass a tax increase called TEFRA, and I always forget what it stood for. Mm -hmm. And I did that against my better judgment, and, and Reagan himself later admitted that that was one of the big mistakes of his uh, first term. That sounds a little familiar because George Bush is saying the same kind of thing, isn't he? Well, you know, it's, it's amazing that people don't seem to learn. Uh, uh, Bush made exactly the same mistake as Reagan, and I keep wondering where was he for all those eight years? Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to talk about George Bush, and uh, I also want to talk about your political philosophy. Lynn Nofslinger is our guest. By the way, uh, your secretary, maybe it was you, uh, said to one of our people here, be sure and tell that guy when he interviews Lynn, don't call him Nofslinger. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. <laughs> call me anything you want. Just call me for breakfast. Let, let me suggest this to you. Suggest that I call you Lynn. I will. Uh, the, the name uh, Nofslinger, I'm, I'm, I don't want to set off an ethnic incident here. What, what kind of a name is that? Oh, it's what? German. It's German. Uh... Uh, well, that's all I can tell you. It's German. N O F S I G. -E oh no, 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 no. N O F Z I G. -E Z I. Did I say yes? I'm sorry. Yeah, I've did. got it right in front of me. Z. All right. <laughs> N O F Z I G E R. But anyway, they said don't call him Zinger. He doesn't like that. Uh, Lynn, uh, you broke with President Reagan. Didn't, didn't you write an article, I believe, for Newsweek, in which you you, you went back after your old boss a little bit? Uh, it wasn't for Newsweek. I wrote a I wrote a. a an op-ed piece uh, that appeared in the Washington Post and in a num number of other places, and I was critical of him because uh, they dumped three of, uh, uh, of Reagan's very most loyal people off the board of, uh, of his library foundation, Ed Meese and Bill Clark and Marty Anderson. And uh, I thought it was uh, uh, not not a proper thing for him to have done, and and uh, and wrote a piece to that effect. Mm -hmm. He wasn't very happy. That's uh, all right. I wasn't very happy either. Have, have you all gotten back together again? Oh, I've talked to him, but he, you know these things. Uh, uh, these things always put a strain on relationships, and, and Nancy's still mad at me, and as long as Nancy's mad at me, I presume things will remain a little strange. She got a little angry at a few other people, didn't she? Oh, yeah, but Nancy, Nancy uh, <clears throat> gets angry at people who she thinks have been mean to her husband or who, don't, who, or who haven't served her husband well, and mm -hmm. I can't blame her for that. That's a rather human thing. Yeah. Uh, but the, the ones that she seems to get the most angry with are the conservatives <laughs> like Pat Buchanan, yourself, and... <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it seems to, although she got pretty angry at, uh, at Don Regan, who's nobody's uh, right winger. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, Nancy got a little more liberal as time went on in the White House, and she, you know, she was looking for her husband's place in history, and people had convinced her that uh, uh, conservatives don't go down as well in history as moderates. Mm -hmm. That may be true, by the way. <laughs> well, maybe I don't. I don't worry about that. And I think Ronald Reagan did much better uh, before he began thinking about his place in history. Uh, well, I say history in the short term. At least the, the newspaper reporters aren't quite as kind to you. Let me ask you about that. Uh, a lot of people maintain that George Bush is getting a real bum rap from the media. For example, he came out with that thing the other day about uh, he actually didn't come out with it. Congressman Dornan did, and then he picked up on it. What was Bill Clinton doing in Moscow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. CNN last night led with a picture of Joe McCarthy. <laughs> That's what you call unbiased reporting, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody else said, uh, well, he's on the low path again. I think that was CBS. Uh, what do you think about uh, the way the press is treating Bush? You're a well, reporter. Well, I, uh, I think that, uh, that, that most of the national press, which uh, every poll has always shown, is about three-quarters liberal, maybe a little more than that. I think that they've kind of got a vested interest in, in electing Bill Clinton. And remember, most of these people come out of Bill Clinton's generation, and uh, they share the same uh, background and, and went through, through the Vietnam War at the same time. So, so I think that uh, that uh, there's no question, but what uh, most of them would be uh, would be happy to see Bill Clinton win. Incidentally, I was talking to somebody 
uh, yesterday who came up with a very good line who said, if, if we can't believe uh, the things that Bill Clinton is saying about his past, how can we possibly believe anything he's promising for the future? Mm-hmm. So I passed that on to the Bush people, hoping they would use it and, and will come back from, from almost sure defeat. Well, that was my next question. Is, is this really kind of a, just a little motion we're going to go through here in a couple of weeks, or is, is the whole thing all over? Well, no, no, no elections all over this far in advance. Uh, uh, somebody can always make a mistake, and if that somebody is Bill Clinton, well, then he may be in trouble. He can foul up in the, in the upcoming debates the way Jimmy Carter did or Jerry Ford did. Uh, he can <coughs> uh, something else can come up. We can find out more details about that trip to Russia and what really was behind it, if anything. Uh, and uh, uh, Bush somehow or other might possibly strike a spark. But if you had to bet today, don't put a lot of money on George Bush. Uh, if George Bush calls you today, you'd give him that advice. But would you also go back and say something about you ought to have been a real conservative like Ronald Reagan was, at least in the first term? Would you well, say something I, like that? I, I think he knows that I feel that way. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and right now there's no sense in, in spilling over, uh, uh, crying over spilt milk. I think the thing you've got to do is figure out how you win this thing. And I think as you look at what he's been trying to do, he's been trying to go out and recapture the uh, the, the conservative wing of the party and, you know, saying I won't raise taxes ever again and I've learned my lesson and those sorts of things. Uh, you, uh, you're, you're not involved in this campaign. Uh, uh, they won't. They won't let old Reagan people into the campaign right? for the most part. They, right? uh, a lot of us have said, "Hey, how, what can we do to help?" And their, their implied answer has been, "Go away and don't bother us." Really? Yeah. So, uh, if, if they don't get a lot of conservative support on that uh, November third, they they ought they have themselves to blame. Is that what? Oh, you're oh I think I think so to yeah. to to a great extent. They. Uh, <clears throat> they haven't made any real effort to to go uh, 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 bring back the Reagan people, whom they have isolated over the last three years. Uh, if you were a Reagan person, it was hard to get a job in this administration. Uh, uh, you, you really weren't welcome, and, and that's too bad because that isn't how you win elections. We're going to take a little, not a commercial break, I want to take a break for your book. That's a commercial, I guess. You want to, let's, let's talk a little bit about how people can get your book. Uh, go to the bookstore and ask for it. And, <laughs> if, and uh, if enough of you ask for it and it's not in the bookstore, they, uh, they, they'll order it, obviously. But it should be in most bookstores, uh, uh, if not by now, certainly by the first of the week. And the title is, is your name, right? Yeah, Nofziger. That, that was the publisher's idea. He thought, well, that'll intrigue the heck out of them. Who is the publisher? Regnery Gateway. All right, okay. Uh, Same people who published Mises' book. All right. Uh, so the book is called Nofsinger. You can pick it up at, uh, at your bookstore. If they don't have it, uh, you can ask them to get it. Uh, you, you obviously know George Bush. Uh, yeah. What kind of a fellow is he? George Bush is a, is a very nice man. He's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, he's, he's a very decent individual. Uh, I think that uh, the George Bush's problem is that, uh, that he's wanted to govern well but hasn't really uh, had any idea of where he wanted to take this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- there's an argument out there that we ought to have pragmatists who take every day as it comes and make the best of it. Others say we ought to have ideologues, people who have a real vision. I, I know which way you're going to vote. But, yeah, amen. Uh, you're going <laughs> to vote for the ideologues. But on the other hand, isn't it true that these pragmatists, uh, th- it, it happened to uh, it, it happened to uh, to Bush, and it's happened, it happened, I think you could argue, to Ford, that, that if they don't really have this vision that Ronald Reagan had or some kind of a vision, they don't get very far. Would you argue that that's a... That well, I think, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I think you've got to stand for something. I think that when the American people uh, elect a president, they're not electing just somebody to, uh, to go through the motions and, and make sure that the, uh, that the books are balanced, which they never are. I think they... Uh, I think they uh, e- elect somebody who they think believes in the things they believe in and uh, and uh, uh, has confidence in the American people and, and that sort of thing. Are we seeing an end to the conservatives in government for a while? Uh, I, I think that it's very likely that we're going to have a four-year hiatus here, but uh, I'm not all that disturbed about it because... Uh, I think that uh, uh, parties get old and tired in office, and, and the Republicans have been in there for 12 years now, and they kind of lose their sense of direction. And, and if we lose this election, why then it gives us a chance to, to go back and, and uh, find out what we're all about and reinvigorate ourselves and, 
and go have a lot of fun attacking the enemy and then and then come back in who, four years. Who would you like to see it reinvigorate itself around? Who, who's your choice for oh, next Oh, you know, there are half a dozen people out there. I, uh, I'm a fan of Bill Bennett's and I'm a fan of, uh, uh, of Jack Kemp's, uh, uh, but there are other good people out there. The uh, people like Pete DuPont and Phil Graham and uh, uh, one or two others. Lynn Nopsing, our time is up. I want to thank you very much for being here. It's been a real honor to talk to you. Well, I enjoyed it immensely. And I'm looking forward to getting your book. Well, I hope you I hope you enjoy it. I had a lot of fun writing it. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Lynn Nopsinger, a very key man in the Reagan years, and uh, just come out with a new book called Nopsinger. And would you know I'd misspell it. I have it right in front of me with a Z, and then I said S. I do that a lot. I wonder if the psychologist could tell me what that means. Anyway, I want to tell you about Monday's show. Uh, an old friend of mine who uh, spent six Count them, six years as a POW in Vietnam. Uh, Robert Naughton, uh, retired as a Navy captain, was a Navy pilot. I believe he was out on a reconnaissance, or no, he was out trying to find a downed pilot when he got shot down himself. Did six years in Vietnam. I have him coming up on Monday. He's now working for NASA training astronauts in Texas. That'll be an interesting show. I hope you'll join us at that time. News coming up next. This is ABC Hornell, WLEA, AM 1480. We're going to take a quick break, check the forecast. When we come back, we'll hear a show from February of 1983. Stay with us on this special Newsmaker Week where we're, well, two weeks now, where we're playing archive programs with Kevin Dorn. Hey there, Southern Tier. Dave Ramsey here for our insurance-endorsed local provider, Jeff Ryan of the Ryan Agency. Jeff is one of our ELPs because he's a reliable, trustworthy pro who provides exceptional customer service. He's someone I trust to give you sound insurance advice. Jeff can search through policies from many insurance companies to find one with the best price and coverage. Give Jeff at the Ryan Agency a call today, 607-324-7500. And now we have on the line uh, meteorologist Rob Kellen. Rob, you talk to a lot of stations. It's minus 8 here right now. What's the coldest uh, area you've heard about this morning? Well, there's two spots, Brian. Uh, the first is uh, northern New England is pretty cold this morning. We're looking at temperatures right now. Uh, generally 20, 25 below across a wide section of northern New England. Uh, St. Johnsbury, Vermont is 25 below. It's 20 below West Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, Watertown, pretty cold. They were 32 below last Tuesday. They're 31 below this morning. Ogdensburg is 32 below. Messina, 22 below. Uh, Saranac Lake is 31 below. Glens Falls, 21 below. And then we've got a lot of 20s below zero from Iowa into Minnesota and up into the Dakotas this morning. I have seen some temperatures, though, in the 35 degree below range. Uh, out over uh, Montana, let's see here this morning. Haver, Montana, north central Montana, they're 32 below. And then we've got a spot, Miles City, Montana, 29 below. Wolf Point, 34 below. These are not wind chills. These are actual air temperatures. And it's why we're so cold here. This air is bleeding down from the northern plains across Iowa, Minnesota, the Great Lakes, and then right into New York, New England, and the mid-Atlantic states. This is going to continue. When yeah, I was going to ask, when does it get better? It doesn't. Uh, not through the next five to seven days at least. I see a little moderation next week and then the potential for more cold air after about the 15th or 16th of the month. So uh, it's all going to be relative. I mean, Wednesday is the warmest day of the week for us, and we're only talking about temperatures between 20 and 25. We've got a wind chill advisory in effect through 1 this afternoon. We'll see some sun. There could be a flurry today as a little bit of moisture comes off the lakes. Lake Erie is freezing up rapidly. Temperatures today 5 to 10 above. Sun came up this morning, 739. It'll set at 449 this evening. Now, we'll have partly cloudy weather overnight. There could be a flurry or two. Lows will be near zero. There will be some spots, though, overnight that get down below zero. Tomorrow, we're partly sunny, not quite as cold, 15 to 20. And then partly sunny, 20 to 25 Wednesday. Temperatures then turn colder Thursday, Friday, into next weekend. Thanks so much, Rob. You got it, Brian. This week on the Newsmaker Shows, we're highlighting the old Kevin Doran shows uh, from the archives. This is a show from February of 1983. His co-host is Steve Gregory. The humor here is great. We had a topic there we threw out. Let's see what happens. Uh, what do you do in your house if you have a grouch in the morning? You know, we all have, those of us who have fairly large families all have 
variety packs in the morning. You know, you got one person who's cheerful and bubbly. They can be a, a problem, too. And then you have the kind who get up like bears, and they just want to do battle with whoever crosses their path. Now, Steve had a solution for this problem, which is no solution at all. And I, I think it speaks to us of the kind of radical that I have to work with here. Steve, tell them uh, what your solution is there for the grouch in the morning. My solution is for the person who is the bear in the morning, take them out on the lawn and hose them down. I think that's terrible. And it, it speaks to me of the kind of person you are, Steve. I, I think most of these people out here take you as reserved and kind of laid back, easygoing type of uh, philosophical almost. And there you are, nothing but a crazy man. Insane. And I would uh, suggest a two-inch hose as well. You need some velocity and some strength yeah. so to they, handle a person like so that. So they know you mean it. That's right. <laughs> You know, a half-inch garden hose is not going to do the job. Well, Steve, I don't know what to say to you, but uh, that's not the solution. Maybe some of our listeners have a solution to the grouchy partner. Well, it's not just, uh, it doesn't happen in my house, you understand. I mean, I'm, I've, no, read I, about, I've read about these. I know your family uh, from one end to the other, and, and none of them uh, no. present any problem in the no. morning, I wouldn't. Right, they're all sweetness and light. Serving whole... champagne at the breakfast table. Oh, yeah, sure. They're all, they're all sweetness and light. And the whole thing is, I've read about it, you see, and I... I, I identify with what could be a real problem for some poor people. Surely not I. It's 11 and a half minutes before 9. There are other things. We've got the, the, uh, the Russians building up their arms and other people saying, let's disarm. And then the other people who uh, look at that same situation say that it's unconscionable for us to arm when there are so many people who uh, need help here at home. There's a big topic for you if you want to kick that around. Governor Cuomo is getting himself into some hot water with a lot of different people having accepted much aid and financial support from the state's unions. I'm talking about the state workers' unions. He uh, now is suggesting that some of those same party loyals, loyal party people, rather, get uh, uh, get fired. So that's not going down very well. And yesterday he was uh, met in Buffalo with demonstrators from the state university, students who are upset about the tuition hikes. And at Rochester, pickets upset about the closing of Craig. Met him at the airport there. So he's off to a rather unpopular start in many segments. Maybe you'd like to talk about Governor Cuomo. Perhaps uh, time to kick around the idea of the the new term for President Reagan. Should he run for a second term? Uh, some of his supporters are saying yes, he's the only hope they have, and others are saying no, he should step aside for a younger man. Well, what's your view? Line is open right now. We'd like to hear from you. It's 10 minutes before 9. We'll take a little break. Ever taken time to compare regular bread and rolls with salt rise and bread? I don't mean just reading the label now. I mean the old taste test. You know, try some muffins you bought in a store, compare them with Dominic's salt rise and bread. Oh, boy, what a difference. The kind of flavor and richness you get with Dominic's salt rise and bread, you can't find anywhere these days except in the small town bakeries. With Dominic's salt rise and bread, the taste and the flavor is so good, you probably won't even want any jam or, or marmalade. You won't need it. It tastes that good without it. Dominic's salt rise and bread. In your favorite supermarkets or right at Dominic's, Erie Avenue and Loader here in Hornell. We had hoped to get Savo Yevremovich on the program, if only briefly this morning, but he's not available. We want to talk about the banking problem. I don't know if you've been following this or not, but the major banks in this country, the top seven or eight banks, have uh, allowed so many loans to third world and communist countries that they really have no hope now of recovering either the principal or the interest, that many of them are on the verge of insolvency. And if the third world countries and the communist countries were to pay back, the communist countries having no intention of doing so apparently, but if they were to pay back those loans, it could put them in great jeopardy. So the solution seems to be for further loans being made to save the banks. Now, all of this is really a very interesting uh, problem. For example, some of the real conservative Republicans are saying that the banks go down the tubes. They're supposed to represent the banking interests. At least that's what we were told. And then many of the liberal Democrats are favoring saving the banks. I'm not sure what I know if I know what their motives are, but it makes a very interesting thing, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to be reading more about it. Just in the last few days, I saw an article in Time and then an article in uh, National Review, and then there was a, a talk show I happened upon the other day in which Pat Buchanan, a former member of the Nixon administration and one of the brighter lights of that era, was, was on television talking about that same issue. So it's a very, very interesting topic, and we had hoped to have Savo on the air this morning just to uh, kick that around. Now, Steve, what's your solution there? Take out the bankers and turn on a two and a half inch. Hose them down. Yeah. Teach them a lesson, <laughs> right? <laughs> Take them out on a cold morning and just say, that's it, guys. That's for lending the money to uh, to the commies. Hmm? I, I don't know. I saw an article uh, by Jack Kemp last night that was on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. 
I'm he's impressed. recommending I'm impressed going further, right. further ahead and, and lending more money and, and not shutting it off now. And uh, I guess number one on the list of countries in trouble is Mexico. They're the one I think that are the most prominent, but uh, Poland is also, and uh, Russia. We lent $30 billion, we didn't, the banks lent $30 billion to Russia, and they have absolutely no hope whatever of getting it back. I think they knew that when they lent it. Why did they do it then? Because if I went down and asked for 200 they would have screened me. Because Caterpillar Tractor was saying things like, we're going to make a big deal here, and would you extend the credit so we can do this? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. I guess they were also encouraged by the administration to do that. Uh, at that time, I think it was the Nixon administration. They encouraged them to uh, make those loans, but now they have no hope of recovering. Then the other side of it that I find interesting, and in, in which I have no expertise at all, but just, you know, the average American spectator watching all these things, and that is uh, what happens with the price of, of oil going down and, and gasoline prices going down. Now, for all these years, we've been told that the reason we're in this terrible situation is because the price of gas went up, right? went from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70, up to $2 a gallon, now it's coming down. And we were told that's what caused all of our problems. Now, as it starts to drop down everywhere in the world except Hornell, we're being told that that's going to set off another crisis. Have you been following that? Yes, I have. So if the price of gas drops, uh, the OPEC countries will be in trouble. And if they get in trouble, we get in trouble. And we've been told all these years that the reason we're in trouble is because they were making so much money. So, Steve, there's no happy solution, is there? No, there doesn't seem to be. I have an alternative solution for Mexico. I, um, I'll write a check and cover the thing <laughs> this time. It's, pr it's probably as good as theirs. <laughs> is that what your idea is? For Mexico. You I'm not willing to do that for everyone. Well, it isn't just Mexico. It's Russia and Yugoslavia, even Romania. I'm not sure if they gave money to Bulgaria or not to hire more KGB agents, but I suppose they did. They gave money to everybody else. It's incredible. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, this has nothing to do with your first question. If I was living with a grouch, I'd just ignore them. But uh, something to give I, you I'm something I'm not. You understand about. that. I'm not. They have alligators that live in the, in the, in the sewers. What's that? And in now? Hornell, we have some cats. And you can see them. There must be, I don't know if they're wild cats or whether they've just been left out too long or what. But they just come right along on the street and they just dump down in the sewer and they live down there. And it's true. Cause You're telling me that we have cats in our sewers? Knows that. Yeah, we have cats in our sewers? Right. Well, I didn't know that. That's right. <clears throat> we're we're in, in Hornell, you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you've, you've seen them come in and out of the sewers? Oh, yes. Sewers. Yes, they're out day and night. In and out. I didn't know that. I, I can't believe that they're a great help to the health of the community, are they, huh? No, I just thought maybe Blackie Deeves ought to know that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I didn't realize that. I uh, didn't know we had a problem with cats in the... Uh, I think the superbugs are a real tender tidbit for a kitty. Yeah, I have a friend who lives in Florida, a girl I went to school with, and uh, they, lived, uh, they lived somewhere near the river. And uh, they had, in fact, some of their frontage was on the river, or backyard, I don't know which, but... An alligator came out and chased their kid, but they couldn't hurt the alligator because the alligator was in a protected species category. So they couldn't shoot or in any way hurt the alligator. That sounds bad to me, but that's the way the situation was. So they had to worry when their kids went out in the backyard because the alligators might get them. Good morning. You're on the air. Good morning, sir. I was wondering if someone else would please comment on this voting that's coming up February 24th in regard to the change in numbers of the county legislators. Would you like to make a comment? Apparently not. Uh, we have a caller. Good morning. You're on the air. Uh, good morning, Kevin. Is it Kevin? Yes, it is. Uh, well, I just like to cheer up everybody, maybe. Oh, good. Uh, I watched a program the other night on TV where the Germans were sending care packages like over to our men that's out of work. Oh, and yeah. that really, there's a little hope for us, you know. Uh, things are going to change. Uh, that made me feel good to think the Germans were helping us for a change, you know? <laughs> you, you, you remember the days when we were sending packages to them, right? Right. <laughs> uh, okay, well, good. Thank you very much for calling. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Two minutes before the hour, 3241481 is the number. I'm not sure if we have time for any long calls, but if you want to give us a quick call, we'd be very glad to hear from you. The line is open. We only have a few seconds. Good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, there's a little paper out in the county called Thinking... And uh, I, my husband bought one, and both sides of that issue is stated in there pretty well. Uh, if you can find that paper, I believe that it's... You're talking about the voting, the referendum? You're talking about the referendum issue is discussed, yeah. 
Is that what you're talking about, the referendum? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Can you I hear me? I can't hear you on the phone. All I can hear is the radio. Oh, well, I'm uh, here. What was your question? Well, I just said you're, you're saying both sides of the issue, both sides of the referendum issue. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, our time is up. Thank you for okay. calling. Bye-bye. Well, that's all the time we do have. Ray Diamond will be back with us talking about how you can plan your own financial future. It's an interesting show, I know, so join us. 1480 WLEA Hornell, New York.